Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Hey, before I get into it, um, like Adam said, we're going to have at Christmas Eve just one service. And what that means, just for clarity, is we will not have Sunday morning services. I have had a few calls asking for clarity. I just want to make sure you knew. No Sunday morning, but we are going to do Sunday night at 5 o'clock, one big service. And the hope is that we would miss the lunch Christmas Eve rush, and we would catch it before the dinner events, right? So we're trying to hit that perfect time where everyone from our church family and everybody in the community can gather and celebrate the birth of Jesus. So come and join us that day. We're going to have a really good time. And another thing um, I want to say before I get in, and there have been a lot of exciting things happening in the life of our church this past week. We had three more baptisms, which is just crazy. And what we're seeing in the growth is life change. And that's the whole point of growth. Like growth just for growth doesn't mean anything. But growth that results in life change and people giving their life to Jesus, that's, that's what matters. That's why we do what we do. But in the midst of that, there are also the other side of things happening. Because anytime there's a movement of God, the enemy doesn't want that to happen. So he's doing everything he can to stop it. And I know many of you spend maybe daily, maybe weekly, but you pray for our church and the leadership. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that. Because just because things are going well doesn't mean the attacks aren't happening. And there are a lot of difficult things going on in the life of our church. So continue to pray. Because we will not let the enemy win. Our eyes are focused on Jesus and he wins. So let's continue to do that together. Now today, last week, we talked about waiting. In this Advent season, we talked about waiting. And what we found last week is that waiting can often be painful. But waiting can also be necessary. It does some things in us. It leads us to a deeper trust and a deeper surrender to Jesus, which leads us to a stronger commitment to him. But there's another side of waiting that I want to talk about today, and that's preparation. I love baseball. I always have. I've been a baseball fan my whole life. There was a season in my life where I would watch about 150 baseball games a year. I don't do that anymore because I have children, and it's impossible. But I I love baseball. I always have. And as I've studied this idea of Advent, what it's reminded me of is all the events that lead up to opening day of baseball season. There's always so much excitement and anticipation. When you're coming into day one of baseball season, everybody has the same record, so everyone's just as excited as everyone else about the possibility of winning the World Series. There's a ton of excitement, but if you were, say, the general manager of a baseball team, and in the offseason every year, you just relied on that hopeful anticipation and excitement about opening day to drive ticket sales, and you just relied on that excitement to hopefully propel you into a winning season, you wouldn't be in that job very long. You have things you have to do. You have to prepare, right? You have to sign free agents. You have to have a good draft and good research on possible draft picks. You have to get good coaches who teach the proper fundamentals and on and on. There's all sorts of things you have to do. You have to prepare. And then think about being a kid when you were a kid at Christmas time. You were always looking forward to Christmas morning to be able to open your gifts and get that thing you were longing for all year long. But If throughout the year you never shared with your parents who you are, what your personality is, your interests, your likes, your dislikes, you never just, you just didn't talk to them, well, the likelihood of you getting the gift you were longing for on Christmas morning would diminish significantly, right? There's work to do in preparation for what is coming. Advent is a reminder that we need to prepare for what is coming. We know that God is faithful to his promises. He's proven that over and over again. And when he says that he's sending a savior, well, we know he will send a savior. And Christmas is our reminder of that fulfilled promise. He sent a savior. But Jesus also says that he will return again. He makes a promise to come back and redeem the whole creation. I mean, he defeated sin and death on the cross for those who believe, but one day he's coming again. And when that happens, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so we wait with excited anticipation. But that also means we have work to do. 
So what does that look like? Your scripture tells us that this world is not our home and that our citizenship is in heaven. It tells us that we're here just for a little while and that one day we will go home. And as we await the promise of heaven, what do we do? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that your word tells us about hope. That it reminds us that all of our hope is in Jesus. We're so thankful that we can open your word and see fulfilled promises. So we know that when you make a promise, you always come through. So God, this morning I ask that you would pour through me the gift of preaching and speak hope into our church. Help us be people who long for you and live for you and do the work of drawing others to your name. I thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In Psalm chapter 130, verse 5, the writer says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. I want you to think for a second about what the writer is saying here. What does it mean for watchmen to wait for the morning? I mean, morning always comes, right? There's never been a time in history where the sun didn't rise in the morning. We can absolutely know with certainty that the sun will rise, that morning will come. And so we longingly wait for the Lord like watchmen wait for the morning. We know without a doubt that he is coming, but there's something else to catch here. I want you to read between the lines a little bit because there's something we can know about watchmen. They don't just sit and watch, right? They prepare. Watchmen check things. They have routes and routines. They're at the ready should someone attack during the night and at the same time as doing all of that, they keep their eyes on the horizon and they wait for morning to come. So today, I want to talk about what that means for us. What does it mean for us to prepare for the promise? How do we prepare for the promise? You know, last week we looked at the definition of Advent, and I just want to, by way of reminder, I want to share that definition with you again. The definition of Advent is the coming or the second coming of Christ. The point of Advent is to celebrate the birth of Christ and to look ahead to the time when he will come again. And as we look ahead, we prepare. And we see this when we study everything surrounding Jesus' birth. I mean, in Luke chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 2, we see a few moments where God reveals his promise to someone and preparation begins. Luke chapter 1 verse 30, this is an angel talking to Mary. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, what do you think happened next? Do you think she just sat and waited? Of course not. I mean, we know a few things she did because scripture tells us. First, we know that she went to her cousin Elizabeth and shared the news of the promise and then stayed with her for a few months in preparation for what was coming. We know that Mary and Joseph got married in preparation for being a family. We know that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem to register their new family in the census. And there are some things we can assume because if if you've ever had children, you know that there's some things that you have to do. You have to prepare your life and your house for having a child. And so we can assume that they made those types of preparations, even though that they ended up having the baby in a way that they may not have expected because of the census, which we will talk about on Christmas Eve. They still made preparations. They got themselves ready for the promise that was coming. And then we can look at the Magi, or who we often call the wise men. In Matthew chapter 2, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, 
During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw this star in the east and have come to worship him. So they saw a star and decided to follow it because it had been revealed to them that it signified the birth of the king. Do you think they saw it and just started walking? Of course not. They prepared. We know, because scripture tells us, that they prepared gifts, and they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We also know that these wise men, the magi, were advisors to a king in another kingdom, which meant that they came from somewhere far away, which means they had to travel. So they would have had to prepare to travel. They would have had to get food rations ready and clothes to travel, tents to sleep in. They likely prepared either a horse or a camel or something to ride along the journey. They made preparations for the journey ahead. And then we can look at Simeon in Luke chapter 2. Simeon was a man who God had promised would not die until he saw the Savior. And we see this in Luke chapter 2 verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Simeon had prepared his heart for this moment his whole life. He had prayed for it and longed for it. He had stayed strong and devout in his trust that God would fulfill his promise. When we read the accounts of the birth of Jesus, we see that preparations were made. God made a promise to send a savior and the world prepared for his arrival. Now, Jesus has made us another promise. That's the whole reason for the Advent season. Advent is a reminder of Jesus' birth And a look ahead to the promise that he will come again. He has promised us eternity in heaven with him. He has promised to overcome this world and establish a kingdom without sin that will never end. And so we need to prepare. How do we do that? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks a lot about living in anticipation of his return. Jesus is asked in Matthew 24, what will the sign be of your return? And then Jesus has a lengthy response. It takes up about two and a half chapters of Matthew. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But we are going to look at some significant pieces of it. Because it helps us understand what it means to live in anticipation and prepare for his coming. So the first thing that Jesus says is that we need to guard our heart. In Matthew 24, the disciples ask Jesus about his return. And his first thing he says, his response is this. Verse 4. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and they will deceive many. He says, watch that no one deceives you. He's saying, guard your heart against the lies of the enemy. God's word is the truth that keeps us focused On Jesus. It keeps us grounded and keeps us from falling away to things that just aren't true. I mean, when the devil is tempting Jesus in the desert in Matthew chapter 4, we get a glimpse into the power of knowing God's word. Remember, Jesus is hungry and tired. He's been fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. He's exhausted. And this happens in verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread which he can absolutely do. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He knew where life came from. He knew where his strength 
came from, that it came from the words of God. We can see here that the word of God is our source of life and it is absolute truth. It keeps us focused on righteous things and keeps our eyes from wandering away from its promises. I mean, many of us are familiar with James 1.22 that says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Well, there's a reason it says that. Doing what the word says protects your heart and keeps you from being deceived. If you go further down in James chapter 1, you see the result of doing what the word says. This is verse 25. It says, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So the first thing we do as we prepare for Jesus is we guard our hearts by knowing what he says. Know his words and you will know his heart. I'm going to say something that you've heard a million times, but read the Bible. And I don't want that to get lost as a throwaway phrase because we've heard it so many times. The Bible is God's word to us. It is the words from the creator of the universe to us. Read it. They are the most important words that have ever existed, and it gives us a glimpse into the heart of God and keeps us from being deceived. Read the word. Also, pray. With the Bible, we have access to the words of God. We have access to the heart of God. Because of Jesus, we can pray and actually go into the presence of God and talk to him. That is crazy. We should not be able to do that, but we can. And so we should talk to him. And also, there's a reason we do church. We do church not so that you can come and sit in a seat and watch a service. We do church so that you can know fellow believers and be sharpened by them and get into deep relationship with them. Because that keeps you strong It helps you know Jesus, and it keeps you from being deceived. It allows you to guard your heart. So dive in and guard your heart. The next thing Jesus calls us to as we prepare for his coming is to share your hope. Share your hope. As Jesus is talking about heaven and his return, he tells this story. This is in Matthew chapter 25, and it's kind of long, so stick with me, but it is incredibly powerful. He's talking about heaven and his return. He's trying to describe to them what it will be like. And he says this in verse 14. He says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back 
with interest. Now, I could preach a whole series on this story, but the implications are very clear. Now, to sum up what we read, because I want to make sure you don't miss it, the master gave his money to his servants to care for while he was gone. He was leaving, and he said, take care of my estate. Be good managers of my estate. Two of the servants turned that money into more money and gave it all back to the master. One hid the money, and it didn't do anything. He gave the master back exactly what he had received. The master was pleased with the first two and rewarded them, while he was angry with the third and rejected him. Again, the implications are clear. God has given us a gift. And that gift is salvation through Jesus and the forgiveness of sin. What he is telling us to do with that gift is to multiply it. Don't just hide it away and be content that you have it. Take it to the world. Tell others about the hope you have so that it can multiply and the gift can be given back to God tenfold. There's a phrase in there that if you've grown up in church any amount of time, it's a phrase that always makes you pause and it will give you chills. It's the phrase where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, did you notice where it came from? The reason it was said was because they multiplied the gift. They went out and did the work and brought him back more than they were given. And so he says, well done, good and faithful servant. The one who hid it away and kept it for himself was rejected. He did not hear that. What makes God say to us when we get to heaven's gates, well done, good and faithful servant, is when we multiply the gift. Share your hope. That is what we are called to do. That's what leads to hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. The servants in this story who multiplied the gift were blessed, while the one that hid it away was rejected. Share your hope as we prepare for the promise that is coming. Which brings me to the last thing that Jesus tells us about preparation. He says, be ready. Now, we know that God is faithful to his promises. So we have to live like we trust that. Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verse 42. He says, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not, let have, would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, whenever this conversation comes up, there's always a ton of debate, right? How will things happen? When will Jesus come? And many think they know the date or the time. And a lot of guys will stand on stage and say, Jesus is coming at this time, and this is why, and they'll point to all these events. But Jesus is really clear that we will not know. Here's what we do know and what we're going to stand on, because we could debate that over and over again, and all it does is create frustration and division, and there's no reason for it. There's one thing we know. There's one promise Jesus made. We know he is coming. So be ready. That's it. We've seen his promises fulfilled over and over again, and so we know he is faithful. And he made a promise to come again, and so we live our lives ready all the time. No part of our life is exempt from living for the glory of God. All of us live for the glory of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 says this. It says, and now, dear children, continue in him. Some say abide in him. What it means is live for him always. Trust him always. Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Live for him always and be excited for when he comes. But until then, there's work to do. When we guard our hearts and we share our hope and we live life ready for his return, it creates in us a longing and an excitement. 
We are here to do the work God has called us to, and at the same time, we are longing to go home to heaven. Life becomes full of hopeful anticipation as we await the day that all is made right. Paul shares in the book of Philippians this this feeling of living in the tension of being here but longing for heaven. This is Philippians chapter 1. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, well, that'll mean fruitful labor for me. What he's saying is, if I'm here, I have a job. Yet what shall I choose? I just don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Again, what he's saying is, we have work to do. There's preparations that need to be made. Our job is to prepare for Jesus' return by calling others to know him and living our lives for his glory. All of ourselves, every breath, word, movement, moment, everything in us is to be lived for the glory of God. No part of our life gets out of it. All of it. But the good news of the gospel is that while we wait, while we work, while we prepare, we know that one promise is already fulfilled. The promise that God made to redeem mankind through a coming savior, that promise was fulfilled at the cross. Sin is overcome at the cross. When Jesus willingly went to the cross to die, the sin of the world was placed on his shoulders and we were set free from the chains of sin. We were set free from the sting of death. That promise is complete. And so we can surrender to Jesus knowing with complete confidence that he loves us, that he has saved us and his, he promises heaven to us and he fulfills his promises. And in the meantime, as we look ahead, we prepare. We immerse ourselves in God's word so that we can know his heart. We share our hopes so that others can find forgiveness and freedom. And we live ready to go home to heaven whenever Jesus decides to call us. And man, that's a good life to live. That is a life filled with hope and joy and longing And if you want to join in on that hope, you can know him right now. I say this all the time. There is no shame in declaring our dependence on Jesus. Standing up and saying, I am a sinner in need of saving is the most joyous moment in your life. There is no shame. There is only celebration and hope. That's it. So if you want to know him, If you want to know hope, if you want to know redemption, come now. There's no reason to wait. I'll do what I do every week, and I'll be down here, and I'm going to sing. And if you want to know Jesus, come and talk to me. I'd love to walk you there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus and the hope we have in him, a hope that stands firm and will not be moved. A hope that knows our sin is overcome at the cross. A hope that knows that death is defeated because of the resurrection. And a hope that knows heaven is coming. And so God, I pray that we are a church that lives that way, that we are marked by hope that we take our talents and we multiply them. We don't hide it away, we share it. Give us the boldness to do that for your glory. God, we thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.